And, uh, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> you did that much better than I could have done. Uh, welcome, welcome to this meeting on. Sorry. Right. How's that? Better. Good. Right. Welcome to this meeting on uh, why does the U.S. want to topple Chavez? My name's Dave Franklin. I'll be chairing the meeting. Uh, the meeting. We will have a. a, a a system of speaker slips. So if people do want to ask questions, make contributions, during the course of the meeting, the stewards will be going round, the team members, with the, with the speaker slips. Fill them in, get them back to the team member, and we'll, we'll try and structure the debate around that. Um, the speaker today is Mike Gonzalez, who is uh, the author of the book, uh, Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution, uh, which will be available outside afterwards. Mike is a member of the uh, socialist worker platform of the socialist, uh, the Scottish Socialist Party, and is a long-standing member of the SWP. Uh, Mike's going to speak for about 35 minutes, so I'll hand over to him now. My, my, can you uh, can you hear that? All right, right, comrades. If you um, if you go from the port of La Guaira and you travel into Caracas, the capital of Venezuela. You go along a highway, and as you, as you go into the city, on either side of the highway are shacks, poor, impoverished shacks in mud fields, clinging to the side of what looked like uh, uh, hillsides about to fall down. And we know in 99 they did, with tragic consequences, for thousands of people. And you move in through those, uh, that, that corridor of shanty towns and poor areas that are called the ranchos, into the center of Caracas. In the center of Caracas, you come into a, a, a wealthy town, a city which has both a colonial center and a whole, a whole sway, the whole area of building, modernist, adventurous, modernist building, built uh, starting really in the end of the 50s and through the 60s. And just that small trip and just that contrast tells us a great deal about why we are here today talking about Hugo Chavez, why we are here today discussing a confrontation between uh, a wealthy minority and an impoverished majority in the context of Venezuela. Just that image. Because the wealth is the wealth that still is the source of Venezuela's wealth and tells us too that this is a wealthy country, that what we're discussing here is not an impoverished country trying to face the dilemma of how to begin to develop, but a wealthy country, a wealthy country which has over, over many years enjoyed, floated on a sea of oil which has brought wealth, comfort and prosperity to a tiny minority and poverty to the great majority of the country. Poverty which means that today in Venezuela something like 80% of the population live in what the UN would define as poverty and half of those in extreme poverty and I think another statistic to throw at you now and I'll come back to in a moment is the fact that those figures have changed for the worse over the last 25 years. In other words, uh, it's calculated now that approximately 64% of the population uh, at the end of, of the year 2000 anyway were living in conditions of extreme poverty and precariousness, a figure which 25 years earlier was lower. So that tells us, first of all, that this is a society with enormous potential for wealth, enormous wealth which, if, rich, if properly distributed, could have created a society of, uh, of relative advance uh, and, uh, and of, of relative comfort. The oil industry of Venezuela um, covers and produces something like 12 to 13 percent of the world's oil production. This is a very important source. Much of it exported actually to the United States. Again, that's significant. Uh, so a wealthy country in which the distribution of wealth is deeply, profoundly unequal. It's that that explains the rise of Hugo Chavez. It's that that explains why Hugo Chavez has emerged and enjoyed the support of the vast majority of those people living in those precarious houses clinging to the mud-soaked hillsides. Why the masses have come into the streets time and again to support Hugo Chavez because they have seen him as a representative and a voice of their interests in, in opposition to those others who have taken to the streets in recent years, those who have uh, used their power in the media, in the oil industry, in, 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 in the economy generally to attack to criticize, to attempt to undermine uh, the, the regime of Hugo Chavez. In that situation, our general position could not be clearer. We are socialists. We see clearly that the interests 
of the vast majority of the working masses of, of, of Venezuela are under threat by a tiny minority mobilizing their economic, their ideological, their, their manufacturing power in an attempt to undermine that government. That's the, the starting point. Today, uh, we are in a, Venezuela is in a situation where in about four weeks' time, Hugo Chavez will face a referendum, a referendum which under the terms of the Constitution which he uh, framed and passed uh, allowed after, uh, the, after the mid-term of any uh, representative, be it president or governor or mayor, allowed a referendum to be called with a given number of votes, in this case just, over two, just under two and a half million votes, uh, 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 claims on a petition, names on a petition which would enable the, that, uh, man, that, uh, that representative to be subjected to what was called a, ratific, a ratificatory or a ratifying referendum. And, and that is what has been successfully called after months of agitation, of accusations and counter accusations of fraud and so on, under the general banner of democracy, a democracy which, as you know, the ruling classes of the world recognize only temporarily and from time to time. Uh, so it is in Venezuela that they have called this referendum. And in, in one month's time, uh, Chavez faces that referendum. Now, it, it's quite clear that um, and there is a debate, and I'll come back to it in, in, a, in a little while, about what the referendum means. But really clearly for us, a referendum is an event, uh, a political event, which is not the terrain that socialists, those concerned with the, the capacity of the working class to act independently, might necessarily choose. It is a, an instrument which is institutional. It's an instrument which can be controlled to a very large extent by those who control the mass media, the, who can manipulate public opinion, and so on and so forth, especially when they're aided and supported from outside, as well as using their own very considerable power inside. So, in a way, the referendum is alien terrain for a mass movement. For us, the key question is not who, who will vote, how to mobilize votes. The key question, although it has to be responded to and it has to be dealt with, and, uh, and presumably it will be dealt with, the key terrain in a moment like this, a moment which many comrades, and I think correctly describe as a revolutionary crisis, or at least as a potentially revolutionary crisis in, in Venezuela, that's not the terrain that we would choose in which our forces can best be mobilized in the context of a mounting class struggle. Our forces are in the factories, our forces are in the workplaces, our forces are in the streets, our forces are in the slums, our forces are on the land, working the land. That's where our forces are. It's their strength and their mobilization, their organization, which really we have to look to to try and see how and under what circumstances uh, the, the class struggle can develop and how, in a sense, how our forces can best be used with their great collective strength. That's really the question we ask. So we approach Venezuela with that in mind. Not a question of, of abstractions, not a question of rhetoric either, but to ask, first of all, where are our forces? How organized are they? How prepared are they as the revolutionary crisis deepens and develops? But let's first of all begin with the other side, because after all, a revolutionary crisis, if it means anything, means that the ruling classes have reached a point where they can no longer, as Lenin put it, govern in the old way. So what's happened in Venezuela? Who are these ruling classes? Well, uh, Chris Harmon describes them, and I think it's a correct word to use on the whole, as rabid. Um, they are a rabid ruling class. They foam at the mouth at every turn. And in a sense, it isn't a particular peculiar characteristic of the Venezuelan ruling class that they get mad easily but rather that they have an enormous amount to lose. I described earlier a, 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 a society that floats on oil, a society in which 20% uh, of the population at most enjoy the fruits of that prosperity and the fruits of that oil. Uh, oil which allowed the economy to grow, allowed the creation of a, of a society in which really all forms of political uh, uh, expression were dominated and controlled by a corrupt political apparatus controlled by the two major organizations of Venezuelan politics, COPE and uh, Acción Democrática, and there's no time to go into their, their origins. Suffice it to say that they made a pact in the early 60s really effectively to share power. Yes, they squabbled over the spoils and who would get what and, you know, what proportion of the gravy would go to what particular group of corrupt uh, bureaucrats and so on, and which bit of the oil industry 
they would farm out and who would get the profits from that. But by and large, for 20 years at least, actually for closer to 25 years, Venezuela was a country governed by a corrupt, deeply corrupt, deeply repressive apparatus of control, which ironically enough, and it's one of the difficulties, was portrayed in the rest of the world as an example of fine democracy, because every few years there would be an election in which the Acción Democrática and COPE faced one another and decided who would take over the, who would take the baton in, at any particular time, and they squabbled, you know, dutifully in public, but ultimately their fundamentalist interests were the same. They represented that class of people who dominated and controlled the oil wealth of Venezuela Venezuela, who profited from it, and they were able to dispense a bit of that largesse to, you know, sections of the, of the organized labor movement, which they corrupted in turn, to sections of the middle class, to bureaucrats, to some professionals. So there's a layer of people who benefited very much from it. But actually, Venezuela was a society in which, which was marked by wealth by the occasional crumb flung from the table, by the extreme concentration of wealth. And one of, the ex one of the representations, one of the expressions of that concentration of wealth, which will become very important, as you'll see in a moment, is the concentration of control over the mass media and the systems of communication. Um, what uh, Chavez calls, calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm not going to say who they are because I can never remember the fourth one. Pestilence, and anyway, you know them. Um, but in this case, he's not referring to those, uh, those uh, mythical horsemen, but to four horsemen a little nearer to home, who are the four people who control well over 60% of mass communication in Venezuela. And through that mass communication, control in their turn, large sections of the state, and so on. This was the concentration of power. But that pact came to a crisis at the end of the 1980s, in 1989 or so, uh, when uh, the beginnings of economic crisis, the beginnings of that process whose, whose unfolding we have watched through the 90s, I think most of us with increasing horror and anger, you know, the structural adjustment, the development of neoliberalism and so on, began in a way in Venezuela with the crisis in the oil industry and the imposition of a series of measures which overnight privatized sections of public services, raised the general cost of living for, uh, for, the, for the majority of workers, the cost of transport and so on and of housing. Um, and this produced a response which has come to be called the Caracaso. Now the Caracaso is very important, not just because it was a massive insurrection of those very masses who came down from the hills who had come to see if they could participate even marginally in the, pros in the, in the, in the prosperity and wealth of an oil-rich Venezuela which of course they never did, but they remained in those shanty towns until this final blow visited upon them by an organization and a president, Carlos Andres Perez, who had the gall to describe himself as a Christian socialist, the, the leader of Copé. It was one drop too many and the city exploded. The Caracaso becomes legend, both because of the mass insurrection of the people of Venezuela, of Caracas in those days, and also because of the ferocious and immediate repression visited upon that movement by the government of Perez, who re replied with, uh, with bullets, who replied with armed repression, the result of which was at least the death of a thousand people in those two or three days of the Caracaso. But I think the important thing I just want to underline is that you know, the, the prosperity of those years, which could rest on, the, on, on, on oil, corruption, you know, the gravy train and the buying off of leaders of the trade unions and so on, reached its end in 1989. And when the population erupted, the ruling class of Venezuela removed, as they had several times before already, removed the velvet glove from the iron fist and came down with all the weight of repression uh, and, uh, and, uh, and brutal confrontation. The important thing, though, is the character of that rising. It was a mass rising. It was an insurrectionary movement. But it wasn't informed or led by organizations of the left. The organizations of the left had really entered a profound crisis. The, the, oil, the, the repression of the 1960s, coupled with the, with the distribution of oil revenue as a form of, of corruption and, and, uh, and of buying off sections of the population, had created confusion. The left was really quite marginalized. Even uh, important leaders like Douglas Bravo, the man who represents the kind of guerrilla organizations of the 60s, found themselves really quite marginal to that movement. 
Now that's very important. The left existed, and many organizations existed in Venezuela, but by and large, they were fairly remote, fairly marginal to the mass movement. Some had Im more influence than others, but by and large, this great rising of the Caracas was not led by a conscious direction, uh, by, a, uh, by a leadership which could take that movement in a political direction. Now, among the people watching that movement was a, a relatively young lecturer at the military academy, a man called Hugo Chavez. Chavez had, had a number of contacts. If you read Michael McGaugh's very good book on Venezuela, published by the Latin America Bureau, you'll see that he came under a number of different influences. It's hard to determine, and I don't think it's particularly fruitful, really, to try and work out who influenced him more. What is the case, however, is that he, along with a group of young army officers who had been trained in the idea, and this is quite important for us to understand, I think, trained in the idea that the military could have a social role. This was a period in which the military regimes were lying, largely giving way, giving way across Latin America to a period of transitions to democracy, guided and controlled transitions. And in this, the young military, the people we might call just as for shorthand, the military reformists would increasingly take a role. But um, this had happened, for example, with Torrijos in Panama, with Velasco in, in Peru and so on. The military, a section of the military leading a process of reform but I want to underline, in the absence of any major political organization capable of directing that process from below and through the vast movement and through the working class movement. That's critically important. So Chavez, whose reason, whose dedication and devotion to reform and national development, whose hatred of the ruling class, we have no reason to doubt, I'm absolutely certain it was real, saw this process of the Caracaso, saw this as a force from below, but also interpreted it as, if you like, a call to action. And in 1992, he and a group of other young officers uh, embark on an on a attempted uh, military insurrection, a military coup. Uh, but that military coup, despite promises to the contrary, was not supported by any major left organization, and it failed very, very quickly. Chavez had made his mark on Venezuelan politics as a kind of as a kind of symbolic figure who could in some way or another, precisely because in a way, because of the way he spoke, because of the way he looked, because of where he came from, because of the fact that he wasn't associated in the public mind with any one political current, could somehow encapsulate and represent the rage, the anger, the deepening poverty, the, the will to resistance of the mass of ordinary people. He was in jail for two years, but, but nevertheless, he, he came to symbolize that reaction. What I'm trying to say is that in a way, Chavez's development, Chavez's political career is the career of somebody who can, for a number of very complex reasons, come to symbolize popular rage, the desire for change, the hatred of that corrupt, visible, cynical ruling class on the one hand, but he also in a sense represents in the, his emergence in his own politics, the absence of a clear, sharply defined political alternative. There isn't any question about that, I don't think. In 1988, in 1998, he's elected to the presidency uh, and uh, embarks on the process of um, framing a new constitution. It is a democratic constitution which has a number of important elements in it, including, for example, the right to recall representatives using the referendum mechanism, including, for example, the long-term projection of the use of oil revenues to develop social programs, including a promise, for example, to introduce uh, new uh, health measures, uh, education measures, uh, specifically to benefit those several million extremely impoverished people in the cities, the, the, uh, a promise to redistribute land uh, in the first place, idle and unused lands, in the second, unproductive lands, in the third, lands owned by large uh, corporations or, or, or individuals to the poor, to, 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 uh, to rural workers and so on. So it is a program which is radical, there's no question about it, and is a program of genuine reform. We have a, a discussion to have, and I'm sure we'll have it, uh, about, you know, in a sense, is this a revolutionary program? Well. It isn't a revolutionary program, it's a program for radical change which necessarily will bring him into confrontation with that small elite who control the land, who control the media, and who control the political apparatus. Now the ideology that he explains what he's doing by using a new term, not entirely new, but he uses it, he describes his philosophy, his ideology, as Bolivarian. 
or Bolivi Bolivariano, I think it sounds much better in Spanish, don't you? Um, anyway, Bolivar, the idea, and Bolivarismo has the merit of being vague and unclear. What is certainly clear about it, however, is the element of national independence, of anti-imperialism. These are clear components of what is meant by Bolivarismo. But we have to ask a question, and I'll come back to that again towards the end, which is the question of what Bolivarismo means in terms of how and under what circumstances those masses organize themselves, how they respond to the assaults of the ruling class, what kind of political expression will Bolivarismo lead to? Now, whether we can have great debates about Leninism or what Leninism means or what socialism means, what Marxism means, but at the very least, whether we, even if we disagree about interpreting it, how we interpret it, it is understood that the issue we are debating is how the working class organizes its own forces to resist a ruling class and to impose a new and different society which reflects its interests. That is the core of the debate. The core of the debate around Bolivarismo is very unclear. And it remains unclear, I have to say, you know, which is that Bolivarismo is clear in what it reflects in terms of an attitude to imperialism. It's very clear in what it reflects in terms of an attitude to the right of national development and the redistribution of goods. It's very clear what it represents in terms of national self-determination. That's absolutely clear. It's also clear in terms of its dedication to, a, to reform and redistribution of wealth. I think we can be clear about that. Beyond that, it is deeply unclear. And it's particularly unclear about a key question which I know can sometimes be very stale and theoretical. But we are living in a time of fantastic, vibrant, real crisis when real living forces are facing each other across the avenues of Caracas. So this is not an abstraction to ask this question. Where is the, what is the agency? What is the, the agency that will bring about the transformation that will resolve this revolutionary crisis? We know, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more in a second about this, we know that the ruling class is no longer able to, to, to rule in the old way, and its rage, its anger, its violence, its brutality in response to the Chavez government, particularly after 2000, is evidence of that sense of its loss of control over, over society at large. That's absolutely clear. So that's one element. The other element, the problematic element, the element in the end that interests us, those of us who are here debating this in this context, is what is the nature of the other forces? How do they organize? What is, what is the expression of the resistance of workers and the, not just the resistance for it to become a revolutionary crisis of the alternative the workers', workers organization represents? And in this, the debate about what Chavez stands for and what Bolivarismo is becomes something very, very far from abstract. It becomes a concrete question of how we respond to the developing crisis. Well, let's skip the beginnings of 2001 into 2002 and reach the point of, of April the 11th, uh, 2002, when the ruling class of Venezuela launches an assault on the government of um, of uh, Hugo Chavez. It's done that by preparing the ground, by using its control of the media to replace even their beloved... I mean, you, to, to, if you want to know what sacrifice means, it is the moment in which the ruling class is prepared to take the soap operas off the television and replace them with continuous news. Their news, not real news, but their news. Adverts, constant crisis reports. Now, Venezuela is one of the biggest producers of, of, of soap operas, culebrones, as they call it, which means a kind of long, slithering snake, which is what they're like, because they're like 300 episodes. But nevertheless, the only thing is you could pick up the story after episode 373, and you know what's going on. So that's one advantage. But the television screens were full of crisis reports, you know, cr uh, danger, crisis, collapse, and so on. It's a device that the ruling class always uses. They prepared the ground, mobilized by the, by the boss's corporation, uh, supported by a trade union which confused a lot of comrades. But this is a trade union of a wealthy industry whose leaders and whose bureaucrats are as much members of that ruling group of managers and executives in the oil industry, profiting by direct relations, by selling off oil on the quiet, by reaching private arrangements with foreign corporations to, to, for secondary production out of oil and so on. They are as much part of the, of the apparatus of control of the, which of a, of a 
apparently nationalized oil industry, but in reality the nationalized oil industry of, of Venezuela at that point is virtually a state within a state, operating independently, making its own economic agreements, uh, uh, channeling profits wherever it does, using offshore banks and so on, completely out of control of the Venezuelan state. That's the reality. So the coup is launched. Um, using all those, uh, all, those, um, all those instruments. Now, we are lucky enough to have a most fantastic record of those days because it so happened that there was a film crew from RTE, from the Irish Television Service, inside the presidential palace when the coup happened. And that offers a, an incomparable, absolutely incomparable piece of historical evidence of a number of things. First of all, it shows us you know, for example, Carmona, the head of the, uh, the em Employers' Federation, who had appointed himself uh, president, uh, was so confident that he'd actually had the sash made, the presidential sash made. So he arrived with his presidential sash, and you see on the film, uh, you know, everybody celebrating and toasting each other in champagne and laughing uproariously as they get rid of Chavez, they arrest him, they take him away to a remote uh, military prison, and, um, and they celebrate this virtually bloodless, well, not bloodless because there had been a number of people killed in the demonstrations uh, prior to it, people killed ostensibly by, by uh, Chavista supporters, but actually by gunmen and snipers placed there uh, quite uh, systematically by the ruling classes. This was an assault on power by the ruling class. And Chavez left with his cabinet, Chavez to arrest and others to who knows where. And we see them celebrating, enjoying this wonderful moment of power. They, you know, their, their rest restoration to their natural place in the world at the top with the champagne and the sashes. Until the camera looks through the window of the palace. And there's this, oh, you've all seen it. All right, so there's no, I, uh, well, all right. For those of you, the rest of you shut up and, the, and, and I will explain what happens in the film because you've got to get a little suspense, tension here. You just ruined it. Anyway, never mind. The point is, and you watch through the window and down the great avenue in front of the Miraflores Palace, people start arriving. Now, you can tell by what they're wearing, you know, their Coca-Cola T-shirts and their baseball hats and by their, by their skin color and by the way in which they arrive, walking, you know, that they have come down from the shanties. And little by little... They accumulate, and they arrive in their hundreds, in their thousands, in their tens of thousands, shouting for the return of Chavez. And what is priceless, incomparable, and something to, to treasure for, for a life long, is the, the way the smile falls off the face of Carmona and the others, as they look and say, oh, that's our support. No, it's not our support. Mm. And then you see them framing, ay, carajo, you know, it's the other side, Jesus. And within, this is two days, this process. Within two days, Chavez is triumphantly returned as a result of the demand of a crowd outside the palace which simply stands and refuses to move. Now, what do we have there? Well, we have a, 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 an, a, just a, a perfect and beautiful, a, a cherished example of what we mean by the power of the class, of what we mean by the power of the movement. The masses brought Chavez back. The masses defeated the coup. Now, it's a beautiful story, but its ending is a little more ambiguous. I'm sorry, but um, this is not a soap opera. It doesn't last 373 episodes. And Chavez returns, and in, his, in the way he speaks, this, this down-home, kind of ordinary, streetwise way that he speaks in his uh, daily television broadcasts and, his, and in, in his way of speaking to the population. He goes to the balcony and he says to people, thank you for being here. You have brought me back. You have restored democracy in Venezuela. And it's quite correct to say the mass movement restored democracy. And then he says, now go home. Now, how should we interpret that? As a piece of tactical wisdom, subtlety? Well, perhaps. But the real question is, where are the forces? The forces in front of, of the National Palace are the forces that have defeated the coup. Chavez didn't defeat the coup. His small group of people around him didn't defeat the coup. Bolivarismo didn't defeat the coup. The mass force, the strength of a mass movement, the threat of mass insurrection brought Chavez back. 
that in 2002. The ruling of class, of course, did not accept their defeat lightly. They began to prepare the next stage of their campaign. And the next stage of their campaign was effectively a lockout, a boss's lockout, between December 2002 and January 2003. A boss's lockout which once again failed. Failed because that same mass movement, those who see themselves as represented in and by Hugo Chavez, used their strength and used their force to and mobilized it to undermine and ultimately destroy the lockout. Now, I th I'm not sure that historical parallels are always very useful, but I just would like to mention one in passing, and that is a situation that occurred in Chile in, in October of 1972, when, you know, a boss's strike was undermined in very much the same way, by a mass movement from below of ordinary people combining and using their forces to distribute cooking gas, to keep the transport running, to keep the, the, the shops open, to distribute food. It was done in support of the government of Hugo Chavez. Now, let's be quite clear about that. And had we been there, we would all have done the same. But we now move on, and we have to ask a different kind of question, a qualitative question, if you like. We are now three and a half years into this process. We are at a point where the ruling class has now used that element of the Constitution to try and undermine, uh, to try and destroy the Chavez regime, if you like, by, quote, legal means. Let's be very clear, though. They will use legal means if they can. Again, I'm going to go back to Chile, if I may, and just use an example from there when in, you will remember that the coup in Chile occurred on September the 11th, 1973. If you were to look at the newspapers in Chile in, in April, May, and June of 1973, you will find in, in organs like Chile Hoy, for example, you'll find an open and public debate between sections of the ruling classes about whether to have, as they put it, it's extraordinary, really. We read in the newspapers. I've got some of them at home. You know, shall we have a golpe blando or shall we have a golpe duro? Shall we have a coup using our economic power or shall we have a coup using our military strength? An open and public discussion about how best to undermine and overthrow the, the regime of, of Salvador Allende. And we both, we all know what alternative was elected. Now these, this is not a peculiarity of the Chilean ruling class. These are the options available to a ruling class which sees its power under threat. And when it does see its power under threat, it sees also that there is one power which can threaten them, their ability, which can stop them from reimposing their power. And that power is not, forgive me, I mean, there are many people, many great admirers of Hugo Chavez, many people who, re who regard him really as if you like, the, the front line in the, in the struggle against imperialism. He certainly may be seen that way by imperialism, and there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the American, that Bush and, 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 uh, and the Americans would very, very much want to undermine Chavez and hope and, and, and fervently hope that having failed twice this third time during the referendum, they will bring his government down. They certainly hope that. It isn't very clear. Chavez is making very, very positive and optimistic noises about the referendum, but it's a difficult one. You know, there is in rising inflation, unemployment is still very high, the middle sectors are terrified, um, and, uh, and uh, the economic situation is still very difficult. Um, clear, Chavez's victory encouraged and reinforced the belief of many, many people that that other world was possible, if I could borrow a slogan from a different context. It encouraged people to believe that they had struck a real blow against that poisonous Venezuelan ruling class. And in this they were right. But these processes are not static, they're dynamic. They move quickly, they move fast. The mobilization of forces is a, is a, is a very quick matter. We know from all the materials of, of the tradition of Marxism that the preparation for such moments is long, but the moments themselves are brief. And what will determine the outcome? In the end, and here is the dilemma. You see, Chavez on the one hand, on May the 16th, there's a, there's a leaflet going around, some of you may have read, which quotes a speech that Chavez made on May 16th calling on the people to be armed. It doesn't mention the speech he made two weeks later. It, when it's discussing, with the uh, discussing the referendum, he celebrated the democratic opportunity to reinforce and demonstrate the democratic legitimacy of his government. It didn't mention the fact that just a few days ago, Chavez met with Cisneros, the most 
pernicious, the pestilence in the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse is Cisneros, the owner of Venevision, a very powerful man who met with Jimmy Carter and uh, who, is, who is currently circling around uh, a kind of vulture, but a very benign vulture with a smile on his face, circulating around now in encouraging people to observe the democratic niceties. He wasn't there when the ruling class of Venezuela were not observing the democratic niceties over the previous three years, but he's there now debating with Chavez and with Cisneros. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, saying something crude like Chavez is selling out. I'm saying that he really sees that the key weapon in his hands at this moment is, if you like, the, are the instruments of democratic, the democratic constitution itself. Yet we know that the ruling class has gone well beyond the use of that democratic constitution, except if and when it suits it. Now, what have the calls been? At, at a moment like this, the question we have to ask, it's a cruel and a brutal question, but it's the key one. To what extent are the masses of, the, of, of Venezuela, of the mass movement in Venezuela, the people who brought Chavez back and defeated that coup of 2002, the people who defeated the bosses lock out of 2003, how organized are they? What are the forms of organization? How ready are they? for the struggle to come, whatever form it takes. And I'm not a prophet, and I don't know what form it's going to take. I might venture a few possibilities just to end with in a second, but, but I don't know. What I do know for certain is that the struggle's coming. What I do know for certain is that this ruling class, like every other ruling class, with its allies in Washington backing it up, but let's be clear about this. This is not an assault by imperialism on Venezuela. It's an assault by the Venezuelan ruling class using its allies and its supporters elsewhere upon the mass of Venezuelan workers. This is a class struggle. And therefore the question for us is not how good is the, how clear is the nationalism? How possible is it to build the, the alliance of national states defending themselves against external intervention? How possible is it to renegotiate the relationships on a global scale? Venezuela has just entered the kind of common market called Mercosur. What, uh, in a very nice touch, um, you know, ALCA are the, is, is the, uh, the Latin, Spanish initials for the free trade area of the Americas. And, um, uh, Chavez has joined, coined another phrase, Alba, which means the dawn, and the letters represent the Latin American, the Bolivarian Latin American trade area. It's a nice idea, it's the idea of, you know, combining with Lula and Lucio Gutierrez, but of course these are leaders who, while on the one hand have represented a program for national development, on the other hand have already demonstrated their willingness to accept the rules of engagement for survival in a neoliberal economy at the expense of their own supporting class members. And really, that's the lesson to be learned. It is not to say we don't defend Chavez. Of course we do. Of course we're against imperialism. Of course we will use every instrument to denounce the, 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 uh, mobilize, the maneuvers of a ruling class bent on removing Chavez for power. But we have to recognize, too, that the survival, success, and progress of the, of the Bolivarian revolution depends on two things. First, that Bolivarismo becomes finally a class ideology defining its class interests, defining where it rests, what its roots are, and what it represents. And secondly, that it becomes not a celebration of the leadership of one man, but rather an opportunity to organize from below those masses who are waiting sitting, waiting for the opportunity to use their strength, to use their forces, to defeat a ruling class which has made their lives and the lives of their families and all those around them so miserable. Yes, there have been advances. Yes, there have been new health schemes. Yes, new schools have been opened. Yes, land has been distributed, though not quite as much as some claim, but it's underway. But the instrument of the ruling class, ironically enough, despite everything, remains intact. The state remains, as it was, in structure, in role, the old state. And you can't use the instruments of that state, which was created, even with its new constitution, to defend the interests of a minority, to then defeat the interests of the minority. Neither the constitution nor the state, even if it moved rapidly into a radical transformation, which hasn't taken place yet, even then, the outcome of this process would depend upon those masses who have defeated the ruling class twice. This time, if they defeat it again, 
it will be because they are organized, because they are mobilized, because, they are, because, they're, because the structures and forms of struggle are built around their collective strength. That's the, the dilemma we face. It's not a business of saying, you know, is, is Chavez nice or not? Is he good or not? Does he mean what he says? Of course not. The question is not what the theory is, but what is the practice. This is a key moment. It's a moment that will affect all of us. It's not about Venezuela. It's about a, a single field in a world-class struggle. But its significance is huge. And it's important that we understand it and that wherever we can, we use what forces we have, what language we have, what ideas we have, to reinforce and strengthen, and if possible, to accelerate the process, whereby the mass the working class of Venezuela finds, develops, builds the forms of struggle which can take this battle forward into a victory, into this bitter and significant field of the class struggle. Okay, comrades, uh, we can open the meeting up now. Um, there's still time to put speaker slips in if people want to. Uh, the first speaker will be Anne Cooper, uh, who will be followed by Adam Sheehan. While Anne's coming to the mic, can, can comrades please remember you've got three minutes. I'll tap the mic after two, uh, and just to remind you. Okay. Um, not, this isn't very rehearsed. I might stumble a bit. Um, Mike mentioned in his, in his talk, um, he made a parallel um, with Chile in 1972 and 1973. And we, we shouldn't forget that in 1973, we saw the end of the IND regime, um, a socialist regime, um, backed in, in a coup, backed by America. And American, I think I want to talk a bit about American involvement in that region and then I've got a couple of questions. I mean there's nothing new about their attempts to destabilize regimes in Latin America and we, as I say we saw it in Chile the sort of end of a sort of counter-revolutionary sort of cycle really um, in 1973 and we saw it in a much more overt way um, if you like in Central America in the 80s um, where you had Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala um, I mean, under the sort of cover, really, of the Cold War, America sort of, you know, backing the murder of kind of um, thousands of people. Um, and one of the questions that I've been sort of asking myself when I look at Latin America today is you have Lula um, in, in Brazil, you have Chavez and the regime in in Venezuela and wondering kind of why that isn't happening at the moment, why we aren't seeing a hot war, you know, the American troops sort of going in, the con you know, con another Contra um, army. Um, and the, the, question, the answer to the question I find in myself is that, well, I think they've got their hands pretty much tied up elsewhere. And, you know, if America is having trouble finding enough people to send to Iraq, of course they're going to have trouble um, sending them even to their own sort of back door, what they certainly look, would like to see as, as their backyard, if you like. Um, so that's one question. Um, you know, is, could there be a hot war, basically? Um, I mean, another, just another quick point. I mean, I love the description of, of Mia, Mia Flores and the action at Mia Flores, really beautiful. But I'm wondering, haven't we seen a sort of military populist sort of regime before in Argentina? Uh, and, you know, and the, the consequences of that. Um, but I, I have no doubt in, in my mind that Latin America and what is happening in Latin America is absolutely key to our movement across the whole world. Not um, just because it's a wonderful example of, of people struggling, but actually because, you know, Venezuela is the fourth biggest oil producer in the world. You know, um, it's, some, it's somewhere that's completely key. You know, the other three are in the Middle East, but then you've got Venezuela. And in a sense, what we do in our struggle here... Um, is, is going to, you know, in the same way that, you know, our struggle in the anti-war movement has been crucial to Iraq, I think that's going to be really important. But I'm just not quite sure how we do actually relate to it. But, um, so I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Adam will be followed by Tony Sevnoir. Uh, but before Adam speaks, uh, I have a question. 
Could the overthrow of Chavez by the ruling class next month convince the working class and Chavez himself of the need for revolution? Okay. I, I'd just like to say that I've really enjoyed this meeting. This is certainly one of the best meetings I've been to. I especially enjoyed Mike's description of that beautiful bit in the documentary where, those arrogant ruling, where the arrogant ruling class realised that they'd fucked up yet again. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, along with like, places like Bolivia and uh, the rest of Latin America, really, yeah. I think uh, Venezuela is certainly a really inspiring example of what the so-called ordinary people can do in a situation like this. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never really liked the description of ordinary people. It sounds a bit patronising and like they're, sort of, they're not capable of anything, but like we've seen in Venezuela, they're certainly capable of a hell of a lot. But, uh, yeah, I'd just like to say, I mean... Um, that leaflet that Mike was talking about, I've noticed that um, in it, John Kerry, who I'm sure many American comrades will know, is, and many people know, is the candidate against Bush, and has been supported by the vast minority of, American, of the American left as uh, anyone but Bush candidate. He said that he thinks Bush has been too soft on Venezuela, which I find is a bit bloody surprising, just confirms that my scepticism about the so-called Democrats in America. I mean, if they think Bush has been too soft, what the fuck is he going to do with Venezuela? So I want to know. But I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I do, I do hope that Chavez does win the referendum, I mean, in the short term anyway. I mean, a right wing, the ruling class, I mean, this ruling class makes the Fox News Network look bloody moderate. I mean, these guys are feck, fucking hysterical. And I, I would not want them back in charge of Venezuela, which is like the fourth richest oil industry. And another country, going back to the old Monroe Doctrine of taking over a country and basically putting more people back in the shacks and destroying what good Chavez has done and what encouragement that he's given to the working class because they do need, in the short term you may need people like Chavez I mean, there's like the argument where's the revolution going to come from around the world and I really do think, I'm going to go out on a limb here I'm going to say it's going to be Latin America because what you've seen like in Bolivia and Venezuela that the working class and the poor and the peasants there because that is still a huge amount of poor they're going to provide a real stern example for us for the next few years. So, yeah, I hope the referendum goes through, Chavez wins, and hopefully the working class and the left gets proper organisation, so able to campaign, and maybe the revolution will start in Latin America. Thanks. Tony will be followed by Dave Vinnicker, and I should have said earlier, if, if anyone is, who's going to speak is on the balcony, can they come down to use the mic at the front? Uh, Tony Samoa from the Socialist Party. Uh, I'd agree with a lot, or most of what, uh, Mike said in his opening remarks, because I think that events in Venezuela have crucial lessons for the whole of the international working class movement at the present time. And I think there's no doubt that things are moving towards ahead. The striking thing uh, for me is the fact that at each stage when reaction has tried to overthrow this regime, has been the sheer mass scale of the mass mobilization, the determination of the masses at the coup at the time of the strike, even in relation to this, uh, this referendum which has taken place, which appears like uh, Chavez looks like he's going to be on the brink of winning it. The masses have risen uh, to, partly to his defense, but mainly to try and defend the issue for the need for socialist policies, the need for a revolutionary socialist program to decisively defeat a, a, a reaction. That, I think, is not sectarian. You up, comrade? It, it's a positive contribution to draw the lessons of Chile and to ensure, or hot, try to ensure, that this movement is taken uh, forward to a decisive victory uh, uh, for the Venezuelan and Latin American working class. Uh, Dave Vinegar will be followed by Chris Harmon, but before Dave speaks, I've got another question. Uh, why did the coup in Chile succeed in overthrowing the government, whereas it failed in Venezuela? Yeah, I want to partly agree with the previous comrade and partly put it in a different way. I think, firstly, but why do we talk about socialism and the importance for socialism and not just continuing with national development? I think if you look across Latin America now, there have been a series of presidents elected, often as a result of uprisings, as in Ecuador, who've come to power on the basis of talking about national development, advancing the country, and so on. And some of them have made some reforms, some of them not so much. Uh, but if you look at, for example, Lula now, despite all the hopes there were in him, he's carrying out neoliberal policies. Uh, if you look at Gutierrez, who actually won as an opposition candidate in, in, in Ecuador, and he went straight to the IMF and supporting Bush. 
But it's not just because they're, it's not that they're bad people. It's that if you try and develop a capitalist economy, because they continue being capitalist in the world as it is, it means you have to exploit, in fact, more the workers in your country to try and advance the economy. And so the, the dilemma for Chavez is if he wants to advance the Venezuelan economy, he might be able to do a bit of redistribution. He could certainly attack the, the ruling class a bit more. But unless you talk about socialism, I mean, you're going to still have exploitation and you're going to end up applying some sort of capitalist policies. But I think the other point we have to answer here in Europe is that whatever we disagree with in Chavez and the movement in Venezuela, if they're defeated, it's a setback for the whole of Latin America and for all of us. It would be a victory for imperialism. So whatever the criticisms, which we need to explain, we have to be clear that we are on the side of the Venezuelan people against imperialism and against their own ruling class. In, uh, and the way we can do that concretely, I think, is building a movement here. Right now, I mean, maybe the key issue is Venezuela, I'm not sure. My feeling is it's still, excuse me, the war against Iraq and so on. The movement we've built in the war against Iraq is an anti-imperialist movement. If the U.S. tried to go into Venezuela, not only would Venezuela explode, Ecuador explode, Bolivia continue exploding, Argentina, etc., etc., but I think also Europe could come out onto the streets again. Not because we've been talking about how good Chavez is, or not either because we're talking about how bad Chavez is, but because we're building a movement on the ground with people door to door, talking about ordinary things and linking that to what the US is doing. So I think we need to continue doing that and also try and make space to talk about Venezuela. In the recent anti-war marches in Barcelona, we've had speakers from the Venezuelan comrades on the platform. I've not agreed with everything I've said, but I think it's right that they're there because the struggle against imperialism in Venezuela is part of the struggle against the USA. Chris Harmon will be followed by Sarah Bennett, but again before Chris, I've got another question. Do you think it's worthwhile people going to Venezuela to help the struggle, and if not, what work can be done from home? Chris. I'll start by saying that if the referendum takes place on August the 15th, there's no doubt which side people should feel they're on. Because the Chavez movement is not a movement of one man, as Mike explained. It's a movement which represents the underclasses, the most oppressed and impoverished people in a society where the class division is more blatant, more open and more savage than in most other countries. If you're in the centre of Caracas by the Hilton Hotel, you can see the shanty towns two or three hundred yards away. And that's expression. And in the shanty towns, people have suffered and so on and so forth. In the Hilton Hotel, they live in fear of the people in the shanty towns. They hate them. That's why they tried to overthrow Chavez two years ago. That's why they organised the bosses strike 18 months ago. And here I think we should be clear about something else. If you look at the dynamics of it, people in Latin America say US imperialism tried to overthrow Chavez. In reality, if the, the old Venezuelan ruling class moved and US imperialism backed them, and you go through the whole background because it made no sense in the middle of the run-up to the invasion of Iraq the United States to start an oil strike, a bosses strike of the oil industry in, in, in Venezuela. If the Venezuelan ruling class moving, and then the United States, as always it does in Latin America, puts it, throws its weight on the high of the oppressing class and the exploited class. Then we have to say in that situation it's a class division. But then we also have to say that the way Chavez presents it, sometimes it's a class division, but he often presents it just as a, a national question. The Bolivarian Revolution, the idea is that all people in Venezuela, or all people in Latin America together, just against outside foes. And it's expressed in his speeches. When he met Cisneros, Cisneros who is the Venezuelan Murdoch, I mean he owns the Coca-Cola company, the water producers, he owns companies right across Latin America, one of the biggest multinationals in Latin America, um, Chavez says, I'm the president of all Venezuelans. I mean, I'm your president, Chitzineros. I work for you and I work for the poor people, providing you collaborate together. And this, this explains this contradiction that Chavez fights, I'm absolutely convinced he's committed, he's not, he's not a crook, he's not, into, you know, he's not trying to deceive people, he honestly believes in what he's doing, but at every stage, instead of pulling people forward, he pulls them forward and then says, no, we mustn't go too far, go back, and so on and so forth. And he relies, he still relies upon the old army, which exists in Venezuela. He's moved some generals, retired some generals, 
moved some aside, one or two have had to go into exile, but it's basically the old army, which has always been a repressive army in Venezuela. And if you rely upon that army, the army officers who come from the middle class, they will go so far in certain reform, but if you do that, overturn the whole of society, the whole of the privileges of the ruling classes, including the privilege that exists in terms of the ar army itself, with the officers, the non-commissioned officers, and the rank and file, they won't go any further. And that explains why it goes forward and back. And that explains the trap he's in. That explains why he's accepted the referendum. But the referendum will not be the end. Really, the, because the Venezuelan ruling class have messed it up twice, they're split, there's a minority who still want a coup, there's a majority who think we can trap him in illegality. We can do what happened in, in Nicaragua, where you, had the, the, where you had the elections, and the first elections, the Sandinistas won, and then you have more and more pressure, four years later, another election, even more the balance the other way, and all the time, Venezuela is a capitalist country, in which the impoverishment of the poor goes on, the unemployment keeps increasing, prices keep rising. At some point, the rich will hope the poor will lose faith in Chavez. At that point, there's two alternatives. They will have one more go at overthrowing him, or they will try, hope that he will go in some election. You Finally, that, someone asked, why haven't they succeeded because they succeeded in Chile? Do you remember Chile? They had two coups and a boss's strike, both of which failed before the final coup. 1970, Bosses strike 1972, June 1973, and then eventually, because, let's put it like this, the, the, the ruling class only have to lose once and they're smashed. Sorry, sir, put it away. If we only have to lose once and we're smashed, the ruling class could have minor defeats again and again, but they retain the power to come back unless we smash them for once and for all. Sarah will be followed by Chris Banbury. Again, I'll just read out a question before you speak. Uh, what is the role of the army in Venezuela? Can it take the side of the people against the ruling class? Um, I'm afraid I'm basically here just to ask a bit of advice from Mike Gonzalez, actually, because I've recently been offered a job to go and work in Venezuela, and if I actually... If I actually take the job, I'll be turning up in about a week after that referendum takes place, whereas one comrade said to me this morning, right in the heat of when the civil war breaks out. Um, interesting, interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> maybe, maybe Mike can talk to me about this later. But I just think it, obviously the stakes are incredibly high. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm still wavering about taking the job is that my, con is that my contract stipulates that I must have absolutely no involvement in any kind of political activity within Venezuela or even about Venezuela, which means I, I presume that if I'd actually signed the contract already, I would already be in breach of contract by actually speaking in a meeting like this and making a contribution. But um, what I would like to know is that Mike talked briefly about the trade unions. Um, Obviously, I, be I believe I've got a right to join a trade union no matter what. So what, what are the trade unions uh, in, in Venezuela? Which are the ones that are perhaps most involved um, in, in the uprisings uh, and defending you know, workers' interests in the, in the present situation? But also to, to look at Venezuela, you know, not only in the context of the internal crisis, but with, with the explosions that have been happening uh, in the whole of, of Latin America, but also more particularly, I think, with the influence of the, of the World Social Forum, um, what took place in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, what has been the influence of that movement in Venezuela? What has been the influence of the anti-war movement in Venezuela? And, and, and do we see also, along with obviously the, the movements that are coming out of the internal crisis, are we beginning to see these outside influences um, having their impact as well? Oh, very good. Uh, Chris Banbury will be followed by Ed Cope and another question before Chris speaks. Uh, why have Chavez and his supporters in the military and leadership of Bolivarism chosen conflict with the ruling class and imperialism? Are they analogous to the petty bourgeoisie leadership of national liberation movements? There's no question America would like to topple Chavez, and we should also remember that uh, Dennis McShane of the New Labour government also welcomed the coup, uh, the attempted coup in Caracas to overthrow uh, Ch uh, Chavez. Uh, however, I think we also have to say United States imperialism and the British wackies have got a problem. They haven't got any troops to spare. They're getting a hell of a beating in Iraq. And we should remember what Walden Bell said at the very opening of Mar Mar Marxism. Fallujah was America's DM bien fou in Iraq. The resistance is growing. If people have been reading the Independent, American casualties mount every day in Iraq. There are no more troops to go. The American economy is dragged into more and more problems. Kerry might say many things, but the chances are, I think, that Bush is going to, is go, the chances of Bush going are mounting. A Kerry government is going to find it very, very difficult to stick with this. 
American imperialism is much weaker than the 19, uh, 1970s. And I just want to end by, uh, end by say, uh, saying this. I think we should remember, we're having this meeting here. One of the primary reasons why Chavez stays is that, yes, of course, is the support of the, uh, the Venezuelan masses, but the other reason is, is what's been happening in Iraq. And if I was Chavez, I would come out open way and say, three cheers for the resistance in Iraq. And actually, every socialist is going to say, yes, of course, we will fight to prevent any toppling of the Chavez government. But also, we have to be very, very clear. We need to stay on the streets, and we need to keep the pressure up in Iraq, because the Iraqi resistance, boy, they are beating the Americans on the ground, and they deserve our support absolutely down the, down the line. I'm just trying to say, I mentioned Dennis McShane and the new Labour government. Tomorrow, the chances are the new Labour government could be on the line when this report comes out about Iraq. And we should remember this. We want to keep up the pressure, yes, solidarity with Venezuela, but we also want to stay on the streets building the movement of Iraq, because this is, Iraq is our Vietnam of the 2000s. Ed will be followed by Colin Barker, who I'm afraid will be the last speaker, but I've got again a question to read out before Ed speaks. Um, why are hundreds of, hundreds of thousands, stroke millions, demonstrating against Chavez, and why do they call him a dictator? I think it's very clear that uh, Chavez, in you know, over the past years, while he's been, uh, you know, uh, come to power and then been defended by the mass movement, the mass movement it has been uh, very central to you know keeping him there. And um, I was sort of going to ask a question really about. Uh, what sort of uh, nat the nature of the response to the, uh, the, the referendum has been by the mass movement um, uh, and what uh, Mike thinks will happen with that. Will it be that there will be you know, uh, some sort of mass campaign by different people who support Chavez to support him in the referendum because you know, Chavez, uh, you said, was uh, saying that you know, the referendum in some ways he saw as a sort of democratic, uh, would be a democratic seal of approval or whatever on uh, his government, or, or, or whether um, actually he'll lose a referendum and, it, uh, and we'll be, end up in a sort of similar situation to the, to the uh, attempted coup. Um, and also, you know, uh, uh, Latin America seems to be uh, one area in the world where there seems to be, you know, a very high level of tension. And I was wondering sort of what the... Uh, what does the specifics of the sort of development of capitalism really uh, lead to these sort of, uh, you know, uh, mass contradictory sort of situations are uh, in places like Venezuela and also the rest of Latin America? Uh, before Colin speaks, I've, I have another question. What kind of popular organisations have emerged in the course of the struggle so far? What is their potential? I, I want to ask a question, because it, it's, it's almost a factual question to which I don't I know the answer. Um, we hear about the mass movement, or the Chavez movement, you know, doing this and doing that, but what is it? If I, uh, I always think, you know, I hear about another country, talking about this, you think, if I was there with other comrades, what would we do? And the first thing we want to know is how are people organizing themselves, right? Now, how is it actually done? If, if hundreds of thousands, millions of people come to a particular place, it is not spontaneous. Spontaneity is the word we use when we don't know what the answer, right? Because we don't actually know what's happening. But how is it actually organized on the ground? You see, if you say the left is weak, I still want to know who is strong. Who got them there? Who's the person on this street or this factory who gets people there and how are they organized? Because unless we know the answer to that, we can't really understand what the possibilities of the situation are. Uh, apologies to everyone who didn't get called in the, in the discussion. Just a couple of announcements before Mike comes back. A reminder that his book is available from Bookmarks uh, outside. Uh, it's £8 a copy. Uh, Bookmarks also have copies of the other book that Mike mentioned, which is The Battle of Venezuela by Michael McCoughlin. And secondly, uh, there will be a meeting for all team members at 5pm in the Jeffrey Hall. Oh, Mike.
Thank you for the discussion, comrades. It's, it's obviously it's incredibly rich and full of possibilities, and I think we've only really scraped the surface. But in a sense, all the, the great issues and the key issues emerge in the discussion of Venezuela. I mean, there isn't any question but that, you know, I suppose the center of our arguments, our organization, and our, our um, focus on the great contradictions in the world system are in, look, in looking at Iraq, but it's not an alternative between the two. Venezuela is another front in the class struggle, uh, which, which connects in all sorts of ways, symbolic, political, and actual material with the, with the central areas of struggle too. So, you know, looking at one is not to fail to look at the other, but actually to look at a different aspect of the same battle across the world. Let's deal, with, first of all, with the referendum. I mean, Colin, I'm going to come to Colin Barker's question last because it is, as I would expect, you know, the, the sharpest, the clearest, and probably the most difficult, but the most important question to answer. First of all, on the referendum. The referendum will take place on August the 15th. It's a curious thing. I mean, Chavez has elaborated this theory about the referendum, which refers back to a very famous battle in the 19th century in, uh, in, in, during the, pro the process of Venezuelan liberation, in which a famous general um, first did a kind of feint in which he drew in the enemy army, then pulled back apparently in defeat, and then laid in wait, or lay in wait for that army somewhere else, ambushed them, and scored a very famous victory. I think that analogy is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous because these are not, you know, battles between uh, essentially cavalry regiments, but something much more profound. It's an attempt, in other words, to see the referendum, to represent it in a positive light as an opportunity. Well, it's not an opportunity. It's an event in the developing class struggle in Venezuela which has to be confronted and dealt with. The actual material uh, issue is that, according to the Constitution, Chavez must win in that referendum, approval by more votes than he won in the course of the presidential election of 2001. In other words, he must gain more than the 56% of the popular vote that he got in the election, the presidential elections of 2000. Whether or not he gets them is, is really up in the air. I think it's quite difficult for various reasons. I mean, there are material reasons. For example, the vast majority of the poor tend not to have the required documents to register as voters. I mean, that's a very simple problem. The middle classes all have identity cards and appropriate uh, national insurance numbers or whatever it is. The poor, by and large, do not. They live precarious lives. They live in precarious conditions in all sorts of ways, physically and socially, and many of them will not have the required documentation, which will remove them from the electoral register, leaving aside the willful fraud, which will undoubtedly take place, like registering voters, for example, in the village from which they came, somewhere in land and so on. These things will happen, of course. Um, whether it will be won or lost, I don't know. I think it's a, very, it's a very marginal thing. But if for a minute we can hope that the referendum will be won, and certainly there will be a massive mobilization to attempt to win it, the terrain on which it will be won is still a terrain in the sense which, whether won or lost, kind of legitimates the claim of the ruling class the demand upon Chavez that the Venezuelan process should be conducted in the context of institutions, in the context of structures which belong to a bourgeois state in which Chavez, yes, is the, is the president, but where many elements of that state remain firmly in the hands of, of that ruling class. In other words, it, it's an event we, which the movement can get through, but the fundamental problems remain. And it's important to remember, too, not that I su suspect anybody in this room has this illusion, but it, it's worth just underlining the fact that those most committed to democracy, be it Jimmy Carter, George Bush, Tony Blair, or other great worldwide champions of the democratic process, will ignore it if it doesn't go their way. And, and Chile is an example for us to remember. In March of 1973, in local elections, the Popular Unity Coalition advanced its share of the vote beyond the 50% nationally, and the response of the ruling class was not to throw up its hands and say, well, fair enough, you won, uh, but to say, all right, let's now move on to the hard coup and smash this, uh, this government once and for all. And I mean, I think we have to assume that the Venezuelan ruling class has this in mind, like any ruling class defending its class interests. So what, the referendum is an event in the class struggle, but the fundamental questions for us remain the same, and that is, you know, how do we organize what the comrade described as the independent organization of the working class capable of taking on and fighting that class struggle on its terrain, the, class, the terrain of class struggle itself. Chavez is, um, 
I mean, I, I didn't go into this because I don't think it's, you know, it's a very fruitful thing to debate uh, endlessly definitions, polarism, whatever. What we can say is, I think, is that Chavez is a radical nationalist, that he is somebody who has emerged, and I, that's why I, I described the process uh, uh, historically in Venezuela, who has emerged for, out of a crisis of the left, seeing political action as the gift of those who are not, as it were, political parties which he's seen to have failed. And in that sense, he comes out of a movement which sees the military as a social and political actor substituting for other absent forces. And uh, in many ways, there are all sorts of quotes. I mean, he, he gives enormously long broadcasts and talks a great deal. So you can probably find almost anything in Chavez's uh, discourse if you want to, including a phrase he once uttered to say, the problem with effective military organization is that civilians get in the way. Now, I don't, he did say that, and it's, it's there on the record. But what is clear is that, and we come to the key question, you know, how has Bolivarismo organized? Well, it's organized in a number of different ways. First of all, you know, the actors on the ground, I think, are very large. It's actually quite difficult to know, but by and large, I think, are social movements. They are housing organizations, they're organizations of local communities, they're uh, consumers' cooperatives, they're groups of uh, organizations of, uh, of small merchants, of people in the informal sector, and so on, uh, people organized locally. On top of that, there is another layer of organizations which have been created since the Chavez government was, uh, was, was established organizations which are called uh, which were first called the Bolivarian circles and later are called the patriotic circles now they are effectively local organizations whose purpose whose whose task it is to implement decisions made at the level of government they are conduits for government the implementation of government decisions but they are also of course organizations which respond to uh, to uh, government requests to defend the government at any turn. The question is, the, the point is, however, that the leadership and the control and the direction of these circles are firmly still in the hands of a structure of organization which to the extent that exists, that it exists at all, is a structure of command. And that's from government downwards, a structure of command. They're also quite small and very, very local and are not, and in a sense their, their, their connection is uh, top down. In other words, they, they, they communicate with each other via government and via the top echelons of the, of the Bolivarian movement. So in other words, while they have generated a net, a chain of command and a chain of communication, they haven't generated a form of organization which can communicate horizontally across the class, barrio to barrio, group to group. So that network, but that's the contradiction, you see, the, the reality of the Caracaso is important not just because of the extraordinary force of the popular movement or because of the terrible repression that followed, but because it tells us something about the character of popular resistance in Venezuela, which tells us on the one hand that the people will fight whatever the risks, in other words, that there is a, a, a movement of the class prepared to struggle, and the evidence is there. The Caracas is one and the greatest piece, but by no means the only evidence of that. But on the other hand, it also tells us that the character that struggle has, has taken has been of, of, a, of the rise and fall of mass insurrectionary movements which have no permanent or enduring or growing expression. That's, in a sense, the problem. And a leadership which is seriously concerned with the, with the confrontations to come and the, the outcome of a class struggle which will be favorable for our side has to address that, has to recognize that, the, that, the inst that our weapon is that spirit of resistance and struggle, but that the task is an organizational one which has been a shortcoming and a problem in the history of the Venezuelan movement of resistance and one that has to be resolved in the immediate. The problem is that Chavez vacillates and he moves between one and the other. He tries to speak to both. I don't think that he's a manipulator. I don't think he's dishonest. I don't think he's a crook. But I think he is trying to effect a task which many like him before have tried to do. I think of Velasco in Peru, Torrijos in Panama, just as two examples. But I can think too of the popular unity government, which is in a sense to become, to to become a kind of conciliator between interests. But at moments of de deepening class struggle, the middle ground is a phantom. It doesn't exist. The mid middle ground is the ground of disarmament. It's the ground of demobilization. To look both ways is to look towards those who are in power. That's the reality. To look both ways now is a luxury no 
self-proclaimed leader of a, of a movement for social transformation can afford without recognizing that the outcome will likely be defeat for the movement. A comrade asked, uh, one of the questions was, won't people, if, they, if Chavez is defeated, won't people see that as a sign they have to organize? Of course not, comrades. They'll see the opposite. They'll see the defeat of Chavez as a defeat for their own movement and their own cause. We should not wish it for a single moment. Whatever happens, we want a victory in the referendum. Well, whatever happens, we want whatever Colombian shock troops they send over the border to be smashed and broken before they cross the border at all. Whatever happens, we want whatever d demands there are to bring down the regime to be successfully resisted. Because, in a sense, what we want is the revolution to advance, not to be driven back to teach some abstract lesson. We want the lesson to be learned of the necessity of organization and of struggle and nothing else. Defeat will demoralize and disarm the movement. It will be a disaster. So we look at it and we say that the absolute necessity now is all right. The referendum has been elected. It shouldn't have been, I don't think. It's bad terrain. It's their terrain. Now it has to be won nonetheless. And then we continue with the discussion that we've been having here, but of course we're having in the movement. The discussion about how we build a living movement on the ground, building out of those existing organizations and networks of community organizations, social movements, Bolivarian circles, whatever they are, build out of these a solid, strong, unified, collective organization that can take on the fa next phase of the class struggle. Because the one thing we can be certain of, we can't be certain of the form it will take, but we can be certain that that struggle will continue so long as the ruling class is defending its control over this wealthy but deeply divided country. The class struggle continues. The question for us is how the balance may be tipped in the favor of, those cl of that class in Venezuela who are part of our class and whose victory will be our victory.